Thanks to everybody for joining our webinar today. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be joined by Steve Schertz and Emma Jenkins from Astrid. Um, as you can see, the title of the webinar is Finding Inclusive Opportunities and Supporting People on Their Journey Back to Work. Um, so this webinar is really designed for those of you who are considering getting back into work um, or just you might be thinking this I know I'm never going to be able to do that. Astrid are here to support you and um, they're going to be giving you some really useful advice and really kind of letting you know what it is that their charity do um, and how they can best support you. Um, so just a very brief rundown of the session. There'll be um, Steve will start with um, about a 15 minute presentation. And that will then follow with um, again a similar time presentation and there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. Um, if you pop your questions as we go through into the chat box, I will kind of collate those um, and um, ask them at the end. We don't tend to ask them in um, the order that they come in. We try and kind of take a bit of a summary of them so, um, so that we can try and cover a broad range of topics. Um, this, there will be a survey at the end. It takes about two, three minutes maximum. It's only a really tiny few questions. It'd be absolutely fantastic if you were able to complete that as it helps us kind of shape future webinars. Um, and it's just lovely to get the feedback from it to see what you have found useful. Um, and as we always say, uh, the recording will go on to our YouTube channel um, probably by tomorrow, I would hope. Um, so if you can't stay for it all, or if you want to revisit any of the points that will be available um, and I'll put a message up on our Facebook um, when that's uh, when that goes live on our YouTube channel. So without further ado, I will. Um, oh, actually, I've forgotten something already. Um, we've got two questions that we're going to ask. So I'm going to launch these now. I will be totally honest with everyone. I haven't actually done this before um, in terms of launching a polling. So if it doesn't work, apologies, but we're going to give it a go. There's two questions, um, as you'll see. I'm just going to pop them up now. Um, and it's one's asking you, are you currently, and then there's four options based on kind of what, where you are with your employment or not at the moment. And then the second one is about how work ready you are. So I'll just give everybody a minute to have a look at that. Oh, that's good. It's working. <laughs> Emma and Steve, can you actually see those results? Yeah, fantastic. No, I can't see the results. I can just see the questions. Yeah, oh. yeah, me too. I can see the questions, but can't see the results. That's fine. I don't think there's, I can't see a way. So I'll, once the votes have come in, we're nearly there. I will um, share those with you. So we've got 19 out of 30 people so far. So we're nearly there. Right then. So the first question is, are you currently so employed and managing POTS? Um, um, sorry, employed and managing your POTS symptoms. We've got 8% of people employed, but finding your POTS symptoms hard to manage is the biggest category. We've got 42% there. Um, not working, but looking for inclusive work opportunities is 12%. And looking for support and guidance in helping make the first steps back to employment is again 42%. So that's for those. And then thinking about how work ready you are, 23% uh, have said not ready at all um, and have given it a number one. Um, we've got 12% giving it a three, 4% um, at four, about 27% are at five. So kind of ready in some ways, but not totally. Um, and then 8% that are feeling fully ready, CV ready and interview. So a real mixed bag as we kind of suspected. So. Thanks everybody for taking the time to vote there. It just is useful for us to have a bit of a, a gauge on where people are. So anyway, I will hand over now to Steve. Um, thank you for, uh, to Astrid for sharing, giving up your time to speak to us all today. And we've all been really looking forward to the webinar. So I'll hand over to you now. Thanks ever so much. 
Joe, thank you very much. And uh, thanks very much for the, the invitation to, uh, to everyone here as well and for spending your time with us. It's, uh, it's great to have the chance to talk to you. Th this presentation we're doing uh, that I'm going to start and Emma's going to build on is usually one that we deliver to companies. Uh, we're often presenting to companies, to businesses and saying to them, um, we represent the invisible talent pool. I'm going to go on to explain who those are. Um, and we're looking for you as companies to understand the landscape that we operate in and to help us by creating jobs for the talent and expertise that we've got. So um, when I, I start this introduction, what I usually do is say to people, just imagine that you have been diagnosed with a chronic health condition. You're gonna find that going to work is made much harder. It may be even made impossible, but you feel frustrated because you still have huge skills and talent and experience to offer. So our charity Astrid was founded in 2018. It was founded by my brother. Um, and it was founded by, um, by a man who um, had been diagnosed with cancer just days after his 50th birthday. He'd had a glittering career. He'd been in the Royal Navy. He'd been in, uh, in, in business as well. Um, he'd been made an OBE by the Queen. Um, but his diagnosis for him suddenly made him somebody who didn't have value. The cancer was stage four. Uh, we lost him in 2018, but not before he'd had the ability to identify what this charity could be about. He recognised that there were lots of people like him. We reckon over 10 million people in the UK of working age have a chronic illness or a disability or in some way acting as an unpaid carer. Um, their careers, their ambitions have been put on hold and we call that community the invisible talent pool. Change the slide, Emma, if you would. Thank you. So as a charity, we're called Astrid, and we connect that community, that invisible talent pool, with companies who are looking for talent and expertise. Now, as I say, I usually make this presentation to, to businesses, and, and for them, I have three requests. I'm looking, number one, for um, businesses that have got a need for flexible resource, um, can take people in part-time, can allow people to work remotely, and I'm looking for them to create opportunities for us. They might be paid, they might be voluntary, they might be training opportunities, they could be placements, but to create opportunities for us. Secondly, I'm looking for businesses that have got um, uh, volunteer programs. Lots of companies operate them, and we need help to, to tell our message, to share this message to as many communities as we can, to persuade more businesses, if you like, to join us and join our community as well. And thirdly, I'm always on the lookout for, for funds as well, to look out for, for donations. As a charity, we operate entirely upon donations. We never charge our candidates for placing them in work. We don't charge companies either for looking at candidates and connecting with them. The only fee we get is when we ask for a donation at the end of the process where the company is able to donate to us as a charity if they feel they've got value from the service we've provided. We feel it's really important because work provides mental well-being, it provides normality. Um, and so we ask those companies to help us to support the individual uh, talent pool. But first of all, let me explain why we do it. As a charity, we are addressing this gap between the invisible talent pool, people who've got chronic health conditions, who have a disability, who wish to use their skills and experience in work. And we connect that pool with the UK jobs market. Um, our talented candidates use, um, are, are, are offer an ideal solution to the challenges that lots of businesses have today. Organisations are facing challenges to bring the right skills into their organisation. Professionals who can work flexibly, who can bring diverse thinking, diverse minds to bear on professional problems. And what we want to do is to get those companies stop seeing the employment of people with long-term illnesses as a good deed or as an act of charity, but recognize that actually it's something that's good for both sides. And post COVID, the employment market needs to change and offer more flexibility to candidates as well. As well as matching candidates with opportunities which meets their needs, we also do some consulting work with employers to help them better understand the needs of chronically ill people in the workplace. And that way we hope to inform, to educate, and to improve the way in which the employment sector looks at that invisible talent pool. And we help people like Deborah here. Deborah is also somebody uh, as a non-smoker diagnosed with stage four cancer, lung cancer. Um, she's somebody who came from the pharmaceutical world. She was a senior sales and marketing manager, huge talent, huge experience, and somebody in her own words who said had spent a lifetime developing the skills, the experience, the capability and confidence to do a senior job. 
But whilst she's managing her illness and looking to, to, to make the best of the, of the life that she has available, she's unable to apply those skills to the world of work because she's managing the, the symptoms and she's managing the, the health regime that she needs to go through. And so connecting with work again in her situation is made doubly difficult. Our mission is to help people with long-term health conditions to find meaningful work. Uh, my brother's career, as I say, was a uh, career in the services. He rose to the rank of commander in the Royal Navy. He then went into the, um, the CBI, Confederation of British Industry, where he identified the, just the value of work, uh, CBI support, uh, small businesses in the UK. 99% of the business landscape is made up of small businesses. And what David recognized was that the value of work is far more than the wages that are paid for that work. Employment provides routine in the right environment. It provides a sense of normality. It provides challenges and rewards. It restores self-worth when you haven't got it, and it builds confidence, and builds confidence on the way back to returning normality. Now, we know that people have different stages of that journey that they go through. We've just seen it in that survey that's been posted. Um, and as you're at different stages, some may be entirely work ready, percentage of people were uh, on this audience, which is great. They've got a CV, they've got a clear view of what they want to do. Their CV supports their background story. There's no great gaps or, or, or holes in it, and they're ready to go. So we support people like that. But we also support candidates who don't have that confidence, who haven't got that story, or whose CV and story tells about the job they used to do, but they simply can't do it anymore. They might have been a primary school teacher, somebody who's now uh, unable to do that. How do they use their skills and, their, and, and identify what they've got that they can bring to business when actually being a primary school teacher is not uh, uh, anymore available to them as an option? So we help people who are beginning their path to employment as well. We offer training workshops. We offer um, uh, help with those CVs. We help people to build their, their profile as well. Um, and all of that is about helping to connect people back with the employment landscape. And um, this slide just serves, I think, to provide perhaps a little bit of confidence for people who are feeling as if that landscape has, has moved on and it's leaving them behind. I think there are six benefits to um, thinking about using the Invisible Talent Pool as an organization who is now challenged with recovering post-COVID. First of all, what's happened is um, working from home or a version of working from home is now much more accepted. Um, I lost count of the number of businesses that would have said to me before COVID, um, Steve, charity's great. I love what Astrid are doing. It's just a real pity. It's five years too early for us. We're not a business that can, can get into delivering flexible work or remote working. Um, a real frustration, um, but that was the view of a lot of businesses. Now, the story is post-COVID, if they're still in business, they've worked out a way of doing that. Um, and they now have hybrid opportunities, working from home opportunities, flexibility in working hours with more opportunity for people to work part-time and a greater focus on family. And those are the conversations that I'm starting to see and starting to have with those businesses. Accepting of hiring via video is also much more, uh, much more accepted um, as, a, as a process for people, perhaps particularly with disabilities, but people on this call as well. Um, individuals who will struggle to get out, get to an interview, then has to go up three flights of stairs to go to an interview room where they're gonna be grilled for an hour on their skills. How can people possibly deliver their best self, their best persona in those scenarios? So if there is an interview process that can be done, at least a pre-interview that can be done through a medium like this, how much better does it give people as an opportunity to sell themselves and tell their story? So there's a much greater awareness and acceptance of that now. There's also a much stronger awareness of, of community care as well, the importance of volunteering. Uh, we're a small charity, we've been going for three years, but we wouldn't still be here if it weren't for the volunteers who help us. You're going to meet one of them in a moment, in Emma, who came to us initially as a candidate, developed into a volunteer and is now paid by the charity on a contract but it's that volunteering help that we get that helps us to support people to go through that process of identifying that future career and identifying what they can do to connect back with the world of work. I think EDNI, equality, diversity and inclusion is also much more recognized and perhaps outside of gender and ethnicity 
it's also starting to recognize the focus on long-term health conditions as well. Um, Sunday Times yesterday, the business section front page, um, an item saying businesses have to wake up to the uh, benefits of employing people with disability. People with disability have a much greater chance of being unemployed. About half of our disabled people in the UK are unemployed, um, as opposed to people who, are, who don't have a disability. And, and that situation has to change. And the more individuals you bring into your organisation who bring that experience, surprise to su surprise, the more diverse the thinking, the better the quality of performance of the organisation. And finally, Brexit. Brexit was, was held up as something that was going to cause a huge issue for the UK skills gap and the skills crisis. Now, this time last year, there were 810,000 skilled vacancies in the UK. Um, the stats we saw from the ONS last week said that 725,000 people have been added to the unemployed list. So that's wiped out those opportunities. But Brexit was posted as something that was going to cause a great problem because we wouldn't have access to international skills. Reality is actually we've got those skills in the UK. You just have to think more carefully and, and more creatively as an organization, what it is you can do to bring those skills to work to the workplace. So what we're looking for from businesses are really three things. Firstly, to adopt a more modern view of the world and to create those flexible roles. Um, there's a verbatim above it, a quote from one of our candidates. Apparently, it was impossible for me to work from home before, but now that I can, my balance is much better. I have the energy to live my life and do my job much more effectively. As I just described, um, redesigning outdated recruitment practices is important as well. Video interviews help people to present their best self. And that's exactly what we're after in redesigned and improved recruitment processes. And thirdly, bringing EDNI off the dusty pages of the policy manual that's on the HR shelf and turning them into action and following up notes like that one in the Sunday Times yesterday with data, with information and with a campaign which we're running to, uh, along with other charities who support people with chronic illness, to get uh, government, to get business, to get DWP, to recognise exactly what we need. Um, and we're not asking for a huge amount. In, in our survey of our candidates, we asked the question, how do you make, uh, what do you need to make the workplace more inclusive? 7% um, came back and said reasonable adjustments, 3% came back and talked about toilets, and 1% came back about assistive technology. And that's a challenge that we have to um, get over with the minds of employers. Employers think when you talk about reasonable adjustments, you're talking about disabled toilets on every floor and escalators and all sorts of capital expenditure. And you're not. Reasonable adjustments in this case is actually allowing me to take my one hour lunch break in a series of 10, hour, of 10 minute breaks, but let me do it every hour, every hour and a half. That allows me to pace myself and to run my day and to work properly within your organization. I'm not looking for more, I'm just looking for a different structure. It's a reasonable adjustment. Um, and that's the, the type of story and message that we see for our, um, for, from our candidates. How can we help you? Well, first off, we wanna help you to, to build your confidence and your self-esteem. One way of doing that is absolutely to get back into the job market. And we find that for those percentage of you that are feel completely unready to do that, um, the processes that we run, we call them pathways, will help you with some career coaching in the first instance that helps you to identify what you can do. Within that, we identify your transferable skills. That's the, the way to think about the skills that you've got that you've built in whatever job, whatever experience you've got at the beginning of your career, at the end of your career, whatever experience you've got, you've got transferable skills and identifying those and then applying them to a career coaching session where we'll actually explore with you what it is you're passionate about. Because if you can work in an area about which you're passionate, then it doesn't actually feel like work anyway. Then we'll help you to build a CV and a LinkedIn profile if that's what you need, but we'll help you start the process of applying for those jobs. And we often find, to point number two, that matching people on a voluntary basis to start with is a much better way of doing it. It builds people's confidence slowly, but surely. You know, I run a charity here, Joe's running a charity in, in POTS UK. Uh, neither of us want volunteers who are going to be flaky, but what we are absolutely accepting of are volunteers who come to us and volunteer their services, recognizing that as somebody with a chronic illness themselves, there may be days when they can't work and things they can't do. And at short notice, they may need to change the plans. That's, that's fine. That's how we work. Um, but by volunteering, those individuals are building their confidence and restoring that normality I was describing. And for those candidates that are interested, training and personal development is part of what we do as well. So over the slide, if we may, Emma, 
let me introduce you to this organization. You probably haven't heard of them before. With You, With Me is the name of them. They're an Australian organization. Uh, they were born out of the need to support veterans. They were actually set up by five uh, ex-squaddies in Australia. And as veterans, they recognized the huge problem with transition from the services into employment. And what they did was put together a training program. They built a series of training courses, technology training courses, and they built a psychometric assessment tool so that they could assess people's skills and suitabilities for those training tools, for those training programs. And the idea being that they would then connect those individuals with job opportunities that used those skills. Over the page, the process is three part. We're obsessed and so are with you, with me, which is why the partnership works so well with uh, helping to, to identify how to bring talent back to work, to how to, how to harness potential and not just experience, to uncover the skills and aptitude that people need. So we run this test in the first place. It takes about an hour and a half. It's an online test. It's an assessment. Then when we debrief it, it tells us how the individual is suited to the types of training programs that are on offer. Training programs we've got initially from With You With Me, there's two of them. One's about data and analytics and one's about cybersecurity. They're both training courses that come with accreditation. They come with opportunities to work at the end of it in parts of business where people are crying out for those skills. Cybersecurity is the fastest growing area of recruitment. Digital marketing, uh, data and analytics, they're all hugely expanding areas. So somebody who's got those skills, who's got the aptitude and can then go through a training program delivered remotely. Um, it's uh, obviously you work at your own pace, it's self-paced, it's tested and accredited at the end of it. Uh, the cybersecurity course is accredited by GCHQ. Um, so we're not talking a Mickey Mouse training program here. We're talking about something that gives you a certification that allows you and we together to identify jobs that you can do. We have a range of other partners as well, um, offering different skills and different courses. We're in the process of putting those together. So whilst we can't do the job of creating positions during this post pandemic period where companies are typically taking on fewer people, we can't create jobs, but what we can do is to turn our candidates with the right skills and the right aptitudes into employees who can suit the jobs that are being created and are being made available. So that's all I'd wanted to say. I'm going to now introduce you to, to my colleague, Emma, Emma Jenkins, um, who came to us initially as a candidate. She found us through, um, through our celebrity endorsement that we have, I'm sure she'll talk about. She became a candidate. She then stepped forward and said, look, I'd like to volunteer and volunteer my professional skills to the charity. Um, and now she's in a, in a paid role with us as our head of fundraising. So uh, Emma, I'll hand to you and then come back for questions. Hi, so thanks Steve. Yeah, so I'm Emma and as Steve said, I'm the head of fundraising for Astrid um, and I have Fox. Um, I'm going to share my story today about my journey back to employment after I had a long period of absence off due to the sever severity, use a word there I can't pronounce, good start, <laughs> due to um, how bad my symptoms have become. But I just wanted to start by saying that I'm aware that for many of you listening, you will be at very different stages of your journey with POPs. As we all know, and we all get told, it's a very complicated condition and it does affect everyone differently. Um, and I wanted to highlight that my POP symptoms now, I still very much have them. Um, and what I can manage in terms of work and employment is very different to where I was kind of five to seven years ago. And actually when I first started thinking about getting back to work with POPs, I remember feeling um, extremely overwhelmed, anxious, and really isolated. And what I'm hoping to do by sharing my story is to help offer some hope and confidence to anyone who might be feeling like that at the moment. Um, so what I thought I would do, oh, hang on. sorry, problem with my screen. There we go. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd give you a summary of my journey back to employment and I'm gonna talk about it in three parts. So I thought I'd start with giving a bit of an overview of my diagnosis, including how bad my symptoms were and the impact that that had on my ability to work, uh, to then talk about my employment journey, so of how I got back to work and the ups and downs along the way. Um, and then lastly, the recent changes really in the last 12 months, which have included um, furlough, redundancy, 
and then a new opportunity with Astrid. Um, and I also just wanted to mention here, this is the first time that I've ever spoken publicly about my um, experience, so I am quite nervous. <laughs> um, but anyway, I will give, uh, start then with a bit of an overview of my diagnosis. So to give a bit of context, I was 23 when I became unwell. I just graduated from university and I'd been successful into getting into a graduate teaching training program with the charity Teach First. And I was working full time as a learning mentor in a school um, in the interim before, before that training started. So my symptoms started quite gradually and over the course of about eight months, they became more severe. Um, I had textbook POT symptoms. Um, I had extreme dizziness. I had tiredness, which turned into complete fatigue. Um, I had constant headaches, which wouldn't go away. I don't know if anyone else on the call experienced this kind of pressure feeling constantly at the back of my head. I remember speaking to my GP saying that I didn't think my head was connected to my body. Um, all of those kind of conversations. Um, I know not everyone with POTS uh, faints, but I had a lot of fainting episodes, really severe chest pains and palpitations and kind of a feeling like I'd been kicked in the chest and this permanent bruised feeling. Um, so I felt absolutely awful and it got to the point where I had no energy and I could barely stand for more than a few minutes without feeling dizzy and like I was going to pass out. And like I mentioned, when all of these symptoms started, I, I was working full time um, and I battled through for about a year before I had to give up work completely. And, and during that year, I had to withdraw from my graduate teaching training place with Teach First. Um, and actually the school that I was working at as a learning mentor, they were absolutely incredible. When I took that job, it, it wasn't a permanent job. Um, obviously it was kind of before, it, it was kind of developed to help support me before I started my teacher training. But they kept me on actually, um, and they were absolutely incredible. And actually I remember when my dizziness was so bad that even sitting on a chair like this, I would feel like I was gonna pass out. So they um, got me this big red bean bag and I used to walk around the school um, and go to meetings and sit on my bean bag. Cause for me, it really helped. The closer I was to the floor made everything feel a bit less scary if I, if I did pass out. Um, we tried a number of things, worked, worked really kind of closely together to try and work out how I could keep my job with POTS. Um, I tried reduced hours, we tried loads of different things, but it just, it just wasn't working and I was just getting more and more unwell. So I'd actually reached that point where I had to stop work completely. So I left my job and I had a year out of work. Um, and during that year, I focused on nutrition. I changed my diet. For me, how I manage my POTS now, uh, diet is actually key. Started a very gentle exercise program, which was pretty much all horizontal. Um, did Pilates and yoga, couldn't do any cardio at all. And I'd love to be able to say that during that year off, I got loads better and I had some amazing inspirational moment that I set up my own business, came up with this business plan, and, but actually that wasn't the case. And I, I slept and I rested a lot that year. I did have some CBT therapy, which was specifically aimed at people with um, long-term health conditions come, come to terms with what they were going through. Um, you know, this wasn't something that was gonna go away. And it was about learning how to live with it and working out how to have a life alongside it. You know, very much the early starts of rebuilding your life. Um, and a huge part of that was employment. Um, everyone around me and myself included recognized that it was time to get back to the workplace and test the waters. But at that point when I was going through this, there was no element for that kind of area of your recovery. There was no support. You know, how do you even begin to think about getting back to work when you've had such a long period of time off and you actually have no idea what you're capable of anymore and you feel like a completely different person. So I thought what would be useful would be, uh, was to talk about some of the challenges that I then faced when I made those steps to getting back to the workplace. Um, and what was interesting when I started thinking this through was actually a bit like what Steve said at the beginning, how many of these barriers are gonna be reduced now because of, because of the COVID pandemic. Um, so I had kind of four main challenges. Um, the first one was around location. I was living in a tiny village um, with my parents at the time and there was very limited employment opportunities and public transport was, was kind of non-existent and being well enough to drive was a, was a big issue for me. So I needed to have a local job that if I wasn't able to drive, my parents could take me and pick me up um, and work around their other commitments. The second was around um, qualifications and experience. You know, like I said, I didn't have a career before POTS. I was in my early 20s. I hadn't started yet. Um, for me, I, I was, you know, I thought I was going down the teach first route. 
And suddenly that was taken away. So I was starting right at the beginning. I had no idea, one, what I could manage and, and two, actually what I wanted to do. Um, and then the kind of the, the next two challenges were around my, my physical symptoms. When I first started considering getting back to work, my POT symptoms were still pretty much out of control and I had no idea what my limits were and how I was going to cope with the pressures of work. And I think if I'm honest, I think I'd reached that point where I couldn't distinguish what when I was having kind of POTS physical symptoms and when I was suffering with severe anxiety. So when was I feeling, you know, really dizzy because it was actually a physical symptom? And when was I feeling really dizzy and like I was going to pass out because I was incredibly anxious because that happens all the time? Um, and then that leads on to the kind of fourth, fourth challenge, which I think was probably my biggest hurdle to overcome. Um, and that was around the emotional challenges. You know, when you're out of work due to ill health for such a long period of time and you lose that sense of purpose and identity, your confidence and self-esteem really do take a hit. You know, how do you even begin to think about going back to a job interview when you're at absolute rock bottom and you've lost all that hope and faith in yourself? And I think for me, I don't know when it happened, but suddenly my illness had become my whole life. You know, I was constantly attending medical appointments, testing and trialing new medications, dealing with the side effects of those medications um, and kind of feeling very socially isolated. And I think probably my social skills had taken a hit too um, because I was living in this complete, complete bubble. You know, how do you go from that to then applying for jobs and attending interviews and then not to actually mention actually coping, coping with work? Um, so when I, this was the bit I really struggled with actually when I was, I was trying to work out how to explain what I actually did. Um, and for me, as I've mentioned, my anxiety was, was a big issue for me getting back to work. So I knew I needed to test working in a, in a place that I felt comfortable and I felt safe. So for me, actually, the first role that I was going to take, it was actually about the workplace itself. Um, so I was very fortunate that one of my student jobs was working for the National Trust, uh, a local National Trust property. So I got back in touch with them to reintroduce myself, kind of said a little bit about what I'd been through. Obviously, they had no idea and kind of said that I was looking to make those first initial steps back to work. And were there any seasonal kind of contract opportunities, really, that I could just test the waters for, for a short period of time? So I actually took on a they, they were great. They took me back. I took on a six month kind of seasonal role because the property wasn't open all year anyway. Um, and for me, I think in terms of my anxiety, it was great because I knew it was just a six month test. Um, I knew I knew the property, I knew some of the people I worked with, and it wasn't about the actual job role at that point. It was very much about could I manage with being out of the house for, for a working day. Um, so that that was that was a big kind of step for me really. And and the second thing was around actually accepting how hard this was going to be and accepting that work was going to have to be my main priority and that other areas of my recovery were going to have to be put on hold. And I think what I mean by that, I don't know, again, how many people on the call um, have sat in cardiologist appointments and GP appointments, and they've mentioned to you about the exercise that, that, that they want you to be doing <laughs> to try and get better and actually how hard it is to try and exercise with POTS and cope with work and just life in general. So for me, I, I won't get distracted in terms of the exercise side of things, but um, for me, I put work before exercise and actually my journey with exercise came, came a lot later in my kind of recovery. Um, so anyway, so that six months, I surprised myself, I managed to do it, um, but then it finished. Obviously, it was a contracting role, so I then found myself right back in the same situation that I was unemployed um, and was back to writing job applications and job hunting. Um, Anyway, so I kind of saw another local job that came up at a local private school and it was an events assistant role. It was a part time role. And I went to the interview and I was really honest about everything I'd been through and why I was looking for part time work and why I was interested in this role. And anyway, I got a phone call and they said that I wasn't suited to the role. So I hadn't got the job. Um, so my initial reaction was I felt it was because I was really honest in my job, in my job interview. Um, Actually, I was wrong. And actually, when they, they continued talking to me, they said to me they didn't think I was suited to that role. But there was another role that they had been looking for to recruit for for a long time. They hadn't found the right person. And they felt that I might be suited to that. So could I come in and meet the, meet the team 
and see if it's something I would consider. But they said to me, Emma, the only thing is, um, it's not a part-time role, it's a full-time role. Um, you know, is that going to be a problem? And obviously at the point at I was that, yes, that was a problem. I, I didn't think I was going to cope with, with full-time work. Anyway, I went into the interview, um, had an amazing conversation, and they basically said to me they wanted to support me as much as they could with how, you know, how could I do this role? So they put loads of measures in place um, and actually made work a very comfortable place for me. Um, so I took the role. To be honest, when I took it, I didn't think I was going to do it. Um, got, to, got through to the three-month probation, and actually at that three-month meeting, ended up with a very small pay rise and a, and a step up as well which was for my confidence was just absolutely amazing. It's something I never thought, thought was possible. Um, anyway, and I'm conscious of time. I've probably spoken for quite a long time. So I'll try and speed up a little bit. Am I all right for time, Joe? Yeah, yeah, absolutely fine. Carry on. I think I'm sure people are going to be finding it really interesting. Sorry. I don't know I'm you go on. Bring people. It's really strange when you just talk at a computer screen. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's um, as if there's no one there, but no, thank you. Yeah. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Um, anyway, so to give a kind of so, so where I was at that point, so I, I'd taken the full time role, was managing to to kind of somehow get through um, with a very supportive employer. So I was there at that job for about twelve months, and then I was then ready for the next step and kind of the next kind of career and personal development. Um, so really, to kind of give a bit of an overview, so for them, kind of ongoing really for about four years, I started this absolute roller coaster of a journey of taking new roles and trying to work myself up the ladder, trying to kind of get myself back to where I felt I should have been. And I think kind of putting a lot of pressure on myself of kind of, you know, I felt that POTS had affected a lot of things in my life and I felt actually I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get to where I want to be. Um, so ended up on this absolute treadmill and trying to fit into this kind of nine till five full-time hectic culture and to be honest, really struggling that I was holding down full time work, but it was coming at a, it was coming at a cost. Um, I was getting incredibly frustrated that I still wasn't able to exercise. Um, that was something that was really every appointment I go to with my cardiologist, we were having the same conversations. And I was just saying, I physically I cannot work full time and do this exercise and him coming back at me. Well, you're not going to get any better than until you get fitter. Um, I was still on high doses of medication um, and I was still having relapses about once every three months and having a complete lack of social life, to be honest, because my whole life was about coping with work and that's the only energy that I had. And I felt very much that I was fighting every day. I was fighting battles in the workplace to try and help manage my symptoms. Um, and I think, to be honest, I don't think I'd really come to terms with the emotional impact of going through this for such a long period of time was having on me. Um, so in terms of where I was 12 months ago, that, that was where I was. So I was in a full-time role, um, but I was still struggling. And then obviously COVID happened. And I'd actually be really interested to hear from other people with POTS, um, how they found the last kind of 12 months, if they have seen any improvements in their POTS physical symptoms, um, because obviously life has slowed down or things have got worse but also kind of how people have felt the emotional kind of emotionally with, with COVID. I, I don't know about anyone else, but I've been incredibly anxious about catching COVID um, and, and going back to where I was about seven years ago and also struggling with the kind of isolation again as well, which, which, which you feel when you're, when you're going through a chronic health condition. Um, so the impact of COVID was a mixed bag for me. And actually after spending all of those years fighting to get back to work full time, I was then furloughed <laughs> and then went through a redundancy process last year. And you know, furlough, the one positive thing about furlough for me was it gave me the opportunity to get myself physically fit. So I did catch to 5K last year and I'm now actually, I've got quite a good baseline of fitness now. And that would never have happened if I had, had to have kept working. You know, my, my, the pressures of work were taken away from me because I was still getting paid, but I could just purely focus on exercise. However, being on furlough also really emotionally triggered all of those memories of being unable to work because of being so unwell. And I think when I was first on furlough, I was working with the mindset that I was going to get myself really physically fit, I was going to get a form of medication, which is always my aim, still not managed to do it yet, um, and then go back to work and actually start to think about new roles and opportunities within the organisation that I was working for. Um, however, 
that furlough period turned into a redundancy process and I really went downhill both physically and emotionally and actually in November had just gone I had one of the worst relapses I had for about five years and I think being in a situation again when work is taken away from you and you have no control over of it just triggered all of those feelings of self-doubt and worthlessness all over again and I tried to look at jobs and I tried to think about what I was going to do next but I couldn't face it I was completely back at that point that I was about five years ago um, of, of that feeling no confidence when I was really at the start of my journey coming back to work and I think also I had that period of I actually recognized just how much I was pus pushing myself to cope with a full-time job and actually it wasn't sustainable and I needed to find a better balance between work and life um, so I actually took, made the decision to not jump straight into another similar full-time role and to actually take a step back and work out what was best for me both in terms of job satisfaction but also for me physically um, and that's when Astrid com is, has come in really so I started volunteering for Astrid as, as Steve said um, when I was going through the kind of furlough and redundancy process um, Astrid gave me a sense of purpose again um, and being part of a community, which it was what I really missed when, when you're not working. Um, and then I was really lucky that kind of when the redundancy process was all kind of tied up, Steve actually said to me, you know what, there, there is a part time job for you here if, if you're interested. And, and I think for me with Astrid, I think it has been so refreshing, but also overwhelming at times to be surrounded by people who actually understand my daily challenges um, and understand my condition. And I think after years of trying to kind of fit in to a box that I just physically cannot fit into in terms of a work placement and always feeling like the different one and the odd one out to actually be working with people um, and volunteers as well who um, are all going through similar challenges and we can all be very open and honest about how we're feeling um, ha has been absolutely incredible and I think I you know for me as an individual I just you know really hope more organisations can kind of create this environment that people with POTS and other long-term health conditions can feel comfortable at work um, and kind of feel safe at work. And I'm really aware now that I've spoken for a long time. So I was going to kind of go over my top tips, but maybe it's better to do a couple of Q&As because maybe some of the questions might end up covering these anyway. So should we, does that, should we move to some Q&As? Yeah, if you want to do that, and then maybe if we've got a bit of time at the end you could always come back to those because I do think that they'll be really valuable but yeah. well thank you so much to both of you I mean I think it's absolutely fascinating and there were lots of comments coming in Emma that people were finding you know what you were saying really useful I think it's so kind of refreshing when you can relate to somebody and feel like you're in the same boat and that things could work out for them so thank you both very much indeed I think the key thing I picked up was we're often told when we get people's story sent in or when we speak to people that this was my plan I was going to be a teacher or I was going to be a vet or I was going to do this and obviously it turns everything upside down on your head you know on its head and I think what you said about transferable skills is just so valid you know that sometimes it's about changing your plan isn't it but those skills can be directed in so many different ways. So I guess it's, you're there to help people try and redirect them to the right place. I, th I think that's right, Joe. And I, th I think it's, um, it it's, a, it's, a, it's something you can do when you are in a coaching type scenario where you know, if you're that individual who's got that situation, you're, you're just not clear at all about what you can do. You don't see those skills then one of the things you try and do as a coach is you you get people to open up about um, identifying them and talk to other people, you know, talk to your best friend, talk to your partner about what they see as your skills. There's a, a question here from Pia um, in the in the set, which is, you know, I'm a secondary school teacher, can't do that job anymore. What, what would Astrid do? Well, what Astrid would do is to help to identify those transferable skills, Pia. And as, a, as somebody who's been a teacher, you've got a, a degree of of confidence in your public speaking, in your communication, you've got ability to, to solve problems, you've got certain areas of passion, whatever your subject areas might be, that would be the areas in which you felt you know, comfortable standing up and, and teaching a group of people. It's about identifying those transferable skills and then through a, a coaching process to help you to identify how those same skills actually lie at the heart of other jobs. Um, one of the, uh, the, the, the our team um, is a lady called Trish Clark, Patricia Clark, 
Uh, Patricia is somebody whose uh, health illness is, is ME, uh, ME and, um, and chronic fatigue. She was a primary school teacher and just over a year ago she started working with us having initially volunteered as well. And what she does is she helps to, to peel back the layers of the onion to understand what it is that you need, what it is that you've got and start that process off so that we can then connect you with somebody who is a career coach or somebody who can help to repair your CV or build your profile so that you're work ready. So you are, um, you've got a, a document that can be sent to a company that, that's interested in you. And then we'll help you with the, the job search that you need as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's a process that, that we've started to, um, to apply to, to a number of different um, of candidates and it, and it always starts with that first conversation. Um, I've just replied to, to one of the other questioners, Sarah, I think, who said, look, I joined, a year, I, I joined some time back. Um, reality is we put this process in place around about April of last year. So it's, um, it's those who've joined since then that have had the benefit of that chat, but it's open to everybody. And we can have that conversation with everybody that joins us, even those who joined a while back. Um, if you just let us know, we'll, we'll get you connected into that, um, into that process. Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, another question we've had come in is, um, do you support people that are currently em employed but struggling with their role? Um, and do you help them find other suitable employment that is better, a better fit for people with long-term health issues? Yeah, th thanks, Joe. Um, absolutely, we do. Um, you know, we're not uh, we're not judging anybody here. And if you've got a, a situation where you've got a job at the moment, but it's just not working for you, um, the the lady that's, that's that's typed in a note saying that uh, the prospect of going back to work after furlough is absolutely you know draining and anxiety making, anxiety inducing. I can absolutely see that. Chances are that's not the right job for you. And and what you need to do is to uh, again sort of reset, identify what your skill sets are, and identify what your alternative options are. But no, we don't, um, we, we don't say, as some charities, I think, do say you have to be unemployed or even you have to be unemployed for a period of time before we can help you. If you've got a, a job today, congratulations. If you want something different, well, absolutely, we'll still talk to you and we'll still treat you in the same way as somebody who hasn't got a job. So that, that, um, that doesn't have a bearing on it at all. Brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, another one is, um, and I'm sure this would be a concern for lots of people, what happens with uh, benefits if you can't manage the work? So if, if somebody gets a job and then can't manage it, is it difficult then to go back on to benefits? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say, I think it probably is. Uh, and so it's the, the route that I, um, we, we, we're not advisors in this sense, where we don't have any legal backing to, to what we say. What we've got is a lot of lived experience. A lot of, a lot of our candidates, a lot of our, our volunteers have got experience of being on, on benefits and therefore know the, the particular challenges that the DWP present. We're building our experience all the time. Um, what I would say is um, that the volunteering route is a great way to dip your toe back in. Um, when you volunteer, even if you're on benefits, you still get asked the question, um, you still get asked to have to fill a form in for the DWP and, and, and provide them with some information. One of the questions, Joe, I don't know if you come across this as well, um, you're volunteering for this organisation, why are you volunteering for them? Well, they're a charity and I, I think it's a cause I want to help and I want to I get involved and support them, that's why I'm doing it. But um, you know, the, the DWP do ask some, some pretty stupid questions at times, but there are forms that you can fill in that then at least register the fact that you're volunteering um, and then that's a way back into work. But I'd be inclined to take that route if you're in any way nervous as an individual that it's actually something you're gonna to wanna to go back over again. Trying to restore those benefits, having given them up once is gonna be quite a challenging issue. Okay, good advice, thank you. Um, somebody's put, I've been chronically ill since I was nine and I'm now 25. Um, I've had cancer twice as well and now living with POTS and other conditions. Um, are you able to help people with getting qualifications? Uh, this person's only had a part-time job previously. Uh, abs absolutely, Joe. And, and, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I described, we, we only had time really to talk about one organisation with you, with me, um, and their training courses are technology training courses, but cybersecurity and data and analytics. Um, we are putting together a programme of other training courses at the moment. We use a psychometric test, as I say, because that's a great way of just understanding the individual, helps the individual to understand themselves as well, which is a, is a good thing, but it helps the individual to understand their situation and helps us to match them with the right types of training course but i'm pleased to say that as a charity we've been recognized by a lot of organizations that provide training and we get the benefit of training courses that are run for us for free which means we don't have to charge anybody anything for that same training program they're all remote working they're all flexible you work as, as much or as little as you can 
Um, there are some limitations, there are some li limits. You, you have to do a certain number of hours a week, perhaps. But in order to get the qualifications you need, they're going to be work based qualifications rather than necessarily uh, academic qualifications. But if it's work based qualifications that you need, Ellen, then um, absolutely, we'd love to talk to you and explore what you might be suited to by way of, of, of the right training course. OK, great. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions at, at this stage of the webinar, the, the chat and everything goes mad. So I'm just scanning everything. But um, how so if people are thinking, yes, Astrid, are, you know, exactly what I'm looking for. How what what is the actual process of getting in touch with you? What's the best way to do it? So very, very straightforward. www.astrid with two eyes dot org. Um, that's where you go. You register on there. There are two front doors to it front door for companies to register that they're interested in talking to us and they might have opportunities for us and a front door for candidates. When you go through that front door for candidates and register as a candidate, uh, you'll be asked the question, as we asked at the beginning of this, how work ready are you? you know, are you somebody who's got a very clear set of experiences, a very clear future ahead of you, uh, a CV that supports that? Because if you are, then we'll connect you straight with the job search process that we've got available. But if you're not, and, and I would always encourage somebody who is um, who, who, want, who still wants to get involved, absolutely to do so. But if you're not work ready, that's fine. And this pathway I've described of a, an initial chat, an uncovering of your transferable skills, then a conversation with a career coach, then repairing your CV and putting that together. Because a CV, like it or not, I'm afraid, Joe, is the thing that it's the currency for, for, for jobs. You know, if, if a company comes to us and, and posts a position paid or voluntary, what they want to see are CVs. They want to see people's descriptive experience. And there's no getting around it. You need something like that. But but again, we can help people to develop those. OK, that's great. Um, we've had quite a lot of questions in about, so, for example, do you help people in Northern Ireland? Do you only support British nation, uh, nationals or anyone with residence rights? Yeah, um, I, I, I replied to the lady who um, who contacted us for, on the international front. All of our jobs and opportunities are UK based, but that does absolutely include Northern Ireland. In fact, we've got a bit of a focus on Northern Ireland at the moment. So I'd love more candidates and more um, and more companies in Northern Ireland. Um, but um, so anyone anyone can sign up. And, and the, the answer to the lady who was international is really that if you've got the sorts of skills and I suggested copywriting might be the sort of thing or web content or digital marketing, things which you can do from wherever you happen to be at the time, then it really doesn't matter. The only thing we do need is a UK address to register you in the first place. But put your mum and dad's address in or something. So we've got some sort of way of of then registering you. Um, but then if you've got the ability to do a job on that virtual way, then yeah, we can still help you. Um, but we are only UK based at the moment. Our plan um, is to, to internationalize this um, at some point, but we want to make sure we've got the, the model right in the first place. Okay, fantastic. Somebody's already put in the chat, I'll be a candidate from Northern Ireland. So there we go, there's somebody. <laughs> um, <laughs> somebody's asked, um, is there a minimum number of hours per week or per month that you think you'd have to be functional enough to be a viable candidate? When we, we devise the system and, and, and the way you register is actually by answering a number of questions. So a number of drop down uh, boxes, one of which, of course, is how many hours can you work? Uh, we are absolutely recognizing that there are people who could do one or maybe two days a month. And that's all they could do. Seven or eight hours a month, perhaps. But I absolutely identify, as did, as did my brother, that for that person, even though that seems almost a ridiculously small amount to be able to make any contribution to anything, if we can find something that allows you to connect with a, an opportunity, paid or voluntary, that gives you value for that seven and a half or eight hours a month, then it's given you value. It's given you something back and it's on the way to building your confidence and experience. There aren't lots of jobs, to be honest, that only require that small amount. But um, we have had some. I'm thinking things like translating. Um, if you've got a, a, an international language, um, signing up with us and then looking at translating jobs, you might only be able to do seven or eight hours a month. But if we can put you together with four or five other people who can do a few hours a month, then we're part of a team. You've got a team then of people that we can deploy against a job. Um, coaching, mentoring, um, you might only be able to take on one person to mentor for that period of time, but you're delivering something which is using your skills and giving value back and giving value back to you as well. Fantastic. It's so refreshing to hear. You know, I'm sure this is really reassuring for people. And I'm sure you'll you'll be contacted by lots of people after the event. So well, thank I you hope so. I've, I've posted my uh, email address and, and by all means, Joe, after this, you know, post mine and, and Emma's email addresses. But uh, the, the only way we can grow this and, and um, I, I made the point at the top of my presentation that when I talk to companies, yes, I'm looking for opportunities, paid and voluntary. 
I'm looking also for volunteers as well, because what we're doing, the, the, the ambition we've got for this is to get our message in front of lots and lots of organisations. Um, we are doing some uh, lobbying at the moment with an organisation called the Chronic Illness um, a project, uh, CIIP, um, and um, we've got a, um, a, a report that we've put together with them that's going in front of um, a committee of MPs. We're looking to get behind those stories whereby people with chronic illness are just being treated as second class citizens or jobs are being created which are just SOP jobs. You know, it's the assistant receptionist job in responsibility for, part, for, for photocopying. You know, that isn't a job. It's not a role that we would, we would want to take on. We want things that will allow our individuals to grow and blossom and restore their confidence. Fantastic. Um, somebody, I don't know that Emma, you've got any advice on this. It might have kind of linked into your top ticks, but how can I um, approach my employer about how I feel in terms of returning to work and my anxieties? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, I think... I mean, this comes down to kind of really good line management. And I think I was quite fortunate in, in a number of my jobs that I had very supportive line managers and I was always very open and honest about how I was feeling. Um, so I would, yeah, I would definitely say to be completely honest, to try and get a, you know, a virtual conversation if you, if you feel happy to do it kind of on video to talk it through or to put everything in writing about how you're feeling. And I think, you know, I, I was having a conversation, oh, I think last week and it was with a, a recruiter um so they speak to you know this wasn't just for people with chronic health conditions but they were seeing that so many people that had been on furlough their confidence was so low and this is for people you know that, that aren't already battling with kind of the anxieties and the kind of physical anxieties of what it's like with a chronic health condition so i think it is completely normal to be feeling like that but i think yeah put it in writing be open and be honest and and don't be ashamed of it um I think, you know, it's perf perfectly, you know, it's, it's very natural to be feeling like that. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just to let people know as well, our um, employment and POTS page is up on the website now. Um, it, I think it only went up on Friday or Saturday, so it's relatively new, um, but it's all information for employers. So you can, there's a downloadable leaflet that you can print off and take. And we had loads of input, including from Astrid, as to, um, uh, you know, in terms of developing that document. So we hope hopefully that will be useful to you and explain to your employers, you know, in quite simple terms, what it is and what adjustments might need to be made. Um, so I think we've probably only got time for one last question. Um, let's have a look. Um, do you have any recommendations for best reasonable adjustment for POTS that they may not have thought of? Anything that really has made a difference to your your working days? Um, I don't know whether if you've got a, an answer to that one. I was going to just cite the experience of the uh, the chronic fatigue group, actually, the ME in chronic fatigue group. And, and for them, it's all about pacing. Um, I, I made that, um, that that reference earlier to, um, to reasonable adjustments. A relatively small number of people say they actually need anything. 7% talked about it. Um, but of those reasonable adjustments, the one that allowed them to pace themselves most effectively um, yeah, we, we, we do that with, with Emma in our meetings. If we've got meetings that go on too long, then we stop. We, we give everybody a bit of a break for a few minutes and come back and carry on the meeting. Um, but if you're somebody who's got a, um, a, 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 an issue, a health issue, which means that you can't do a long and sustained period at work, um, then that's the type of adjustment that will help make life easier for you. Go on, Emma. Did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so I, I think this is really interesting. I actually think with kind of when you talk about reasonable adjustments for people with POTS. I actually think if, if, a lot of if a lot of employees kind of kind of treated life, their work life a little bit like they had POTS, I think everyone would feel better. Um, yeah, so for me, it's very much about, I don't have too many video calls on each day, um, always have breaks in between, in between calls. Um, and again, so for me, you know, like I said, in, I can't remember if I said this actually, in two, in two of my jobs when I got back to work, I actually was in a situation where I could sleep at lunchtime because of the environment that I was working in. And that for me was an absolute game changer because I could work the morning, I'd eat lunch, I'd sleep and then start the, start the afternoon. So I, I could deal with little chunks of the day and I knew I was going to have that horizontal time. Now before COVID, probably saying that out loud in a lot of employers would be like, oh, how, how are we supposed to have beds for all these people? But actually now with home working, you can do that. And actually I think 
So I have long lunch breaks um, because I do have hot food every lunchtime. I have, I have a cover, obviously, as all you'd know with pots, um, very salty lunches. So I do have a big hot lunch. And then I do tend to have at least kind of 20 minutes. Like, I don't always sleep, but I will have that 20 minutes horizontal time. And then I'll do a bit of exercise as well. Um, and I, I think this comes down to kind of under, employers understanding actually what flexible working is. And I think a lot of people think flexible working is, oh, you can work from home. But it's so much more than that. And actually, for me, I do tend to probably have kind of between one and three. I don't tend to work. Um, and then, I, then I'll log back on in the evening, but then work till kind of seven. Um, so that's what, yeah, it's just you, you can do everything. You just have to do it slightly differently and kind of take a bit longer with things. Yeah, yeah that's wow. right. Great, great advice. Well, I think we will we will leave it there now. Um, uh, Astrid have sent through a document that I will email around to everybody who attended today, and it's got just their email address and how to contact them and things like that on and some useful information. So I'll circulate that. Um, like I said before, this will be up on our YouTube channel um, within the next couple of days. Um, but yeah, just you know, get in touch with Astrid, and I just think it was such a valuable session. Emma, thank you for sharing your story because I'm sure that was nerve wracking for the first time, but I'm sure it was really valuable to lots of people, and you know, really inspiring to see how things can go. So, and be brave, everyone. You know, don't be ashamed, like Emma said, and and ask ask for help. Really, ask for those adjustments. So, and I'm yeah, sure. hopefully we'll see some good. Some good and changes. Much, uh, and, and Joe, how much value has Emma brought to our charity? You know, taking somebody on who who's come from the, this world, who understands the needs of our candidates, who understands the, the, what the charity is trying to do as well. It's so valuable to us. So, you know, we're, we're an employer, of course, we are as a charity, but we've um, we've benefited hugely from having someone of Emma's experience and perspective joining us. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Everybody has a value. You just have to uncover what that value is and then apply it in the right situation. I think that's a lovely note to finish on. So thank you both very much indeed. If people would take the time to do the survey, it would be really appreciated. Um, and thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.